Hi, this is Nick Hodge, editor of Wall Street's Underground Profits. I'm here on the sidelines of the International Metals Writers Conference in the Coal Harbor Room at the Pan Pacific in Vancouver. I'm sitting here with Stephen Dean. He's the chairman, CEO, and director of Atlantic Gold, which is the only fully financed, permitted, and under construction gold project owned by a junior in Canada. And we were just going to have a little chat here about the, the gold markets and, and what's been going on, particularly as it relates to the, the acquisition of, of, of junior gold companies in, in Canada. Stephen, what's the trend been? We've seen just in the past couple of weeks or so, El Dorado take out Integra. And in, in before that, we've seen Kamenak taken out in the Yukon. Why is the trend towards buying out Canadian juniors? What's the rationale behind the majors there? Well. As you know, Nick, I've been in this business for almost 30 years, and so um, part of it is just where we are in the cycle of the sector. Um, but the other part of it is, um, you know, it's getting more and more difficult to find and own production in the safer places, uh, jurisdiction-wise, uh, around the world. Um, and so as a result, there's been a fair amount of focus of activity on companies with projects in, in mining friendly jurisdictions, um, uh, mining tradition countries like Canada uh, and North America generally, but particularly Canada. Um, and uh, a lot of companies want to rebalance their jurisdictional risk, uh, the bigger ones at least, um, by bolting on local production in Canada. So the, the El Dorados, the, the, the gold cloak acquisitions in, the, in recent times, I think are partly driven by that. So going back to the Integra story, the other primary operations were in Greece and in, in, in Turkey and in two places that in recent years that have had some geopolitical tensions, so some, some debt crises. What makes Canada a, a mining friendly jurisdiction? And particularly Nova Scotia, if you will sense of trust in the, the transparency of the rules, um, the ease with which the process can be followed to, to put a new mine into production, um, a lack of, um, of expropriation of, of assets in the history of, of, uh, of the country, those sorts of things uh, would drive that. Um, and for us in Nova Scotia specifically, it's been a, uh, through two different sides of politics in provincial politics in Nova Scotia, uh, it's been a province that has been supportive of the mining sector. Um, uh, industry in other sectors has de been declining, like in the forestry business, in the fishery business, in, in Maritime Canada. And so um, what the mining business brings is, is jobs and employment and economic activity in the interior of the province, which most industries don't or, or can't. Um, and, and so that's where jobs are most in most need. Uh, and so as an industry, I think we, we, we bring good things to a provincial economy. Now you're no stranger to, to putting together projects, specifically producing projects that, that majors have taken an interest in. You were a, a founding member of the Normandy Poseidon Group that ultimately became the largest gold producer in Australia and was taken out by Newmont. Uh, and you're also a co-founder of, of Pac Rim, which was ultimately absorbed by Tech. Hey, can you talk a little bit about what you learned in those, in those takeout and absorption processes and how you're translating that into Atlantic Gold's current project? Yeah, no, no one company is ever the same. Um, um, I think Normandy uh, was 12 years in the making before it was acquired in that three-way merger with Newmont and Franco Nevada. Um, uh, Pac-Man, for example, was uh, uh, of the order of three or four years. Um, it depends on where we are in the cycle, uh, but Inevitably, um, uh, because of the, the fact that this is a depleting resource business, that the, the larger companies do need to aggregate and, and add their resources uh, to their resources. And one of the, as a former president and or CEO of, of uh, senior or intermediate companies, um, you have to include 
acquisitions, M&A activity in your source of growth, uh, in addition to things like expiration, of course, uh, in order to continue to grow and even just replace those depleting resources. So I think you have a great project that could help potentially a major, you know, replace some of those depleting resources. You have the Moose River Consolidated Project in Nova Scotia. It's under construction, it's uh, on budget, it's ahead of schedule, and it's scheduled to be commissioned in September, to be producing gold in September. Can you talk a little bit about um, what differentiates Atlantic Gold from other juniors out there and, and why, as a, as a junior stock goes from development into production, there can potentially be a, a, a re-rating in the stock and why it becomes more valuable? I'm glad you raised the question of differentiators because I think every company should have differentiators uh, within their strategic thinking because that will drive strategy going forward for each uh, and every company. and, and uh, and, and that's an important part of, of, of how you grow a business. The differentiators that I think we have um, uh, in particular are a high degree of insider and board uh, ownership. Um, board and management own of the order of 35% of the company together with associates. Um, um, as a management group, we've got a, a long and deep track record of growing companies from a small base uh, to a larger one. And you touched on a little bit of my background, but also uh, Maurice Bellanger, our COO, has got a very strong background in helping to grow the businesses of Kinross and Gold Corp uh, in, in their early days. Uh, they're two key differentiators, and, and, and that second one is all about people, and it doesn't matter what industry you're in, uh, the track record of the people who you're trusting your money with as shareholders is absolutely critical uh, in, in a, making an investment decision. Um, I think that the, the biggest um, differentiator for us uh, in, um, amongst our peers is uh, what we call risk management. And to be clear, what risk management means in, in our sense is things like um, entering into fixed price contracts for the construction and development of the mine. Uh, we have a contract with a company called Asenco, who I have known for a long time. They're originally Australian based, but they've got a very large North American presence here now. Um, and this will be the first gold processing facility uh, constructed under a fixed price contract. Um, why that is important is that it helps us as management defray those and, and manage and eliminate in some cases the risks attached to developing gold projects. And the history of our, our sector unfortunately has been one where management have promised certain things on, on bills and, and capital budgets and, and in many cases in recent times haven't delivered and so as a result it, it lost the confidence of, um, of, of uh, investors. Uh, that's one. Um, things like uh, high density production drilling or we call it grade control drilling which manages the risk of tons and grade. Uh, it, it helps us as management de de delineate with gre greater accuracy because of the amount of data we have uh, ore and waste in the floor of an open pit. Um, and and we've, we did that almost two years ago. Uh, uh, and that resulted in us as management, but also our, our financial supporters, including our bankers, as a, result, as, as a result had a much higher degree of confidence in the resource and the deliverability of the tons of grade that we expected, particularly in that first year of startup. Well, let's talk about the project specifics a little bit. It's great to see and refreshing, I, I'll add, to see a, a junior be good stewards of shareholder capital and, and you know, under promise and over deliver as opposed to the inverse of that. Um, now, the, the people is one thing and it's great to see the people and the track record and how they manage risk, but that also translates to the project as well because it's a fantastic project. You want to talk about the, the, the capital cost of the project, the, the all-in sustaining cost, and, and maybe a little bit about why being in Canada and the, and the currency valuation at the present day helps Atlantic Gold? Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, we were very deliberate about our strategy in identifying uh, Moose River as, as a project for us to take forward. Nick, you mentioned CapEx. Um, 
that was a big driver for us in terms of uh, the attraction uh, of the project for, for us to develop. Um, it's a manage what we call a manageable amount. It was of the order of 130, 140 million dollars of, of Canadian dollar capital. That differentiates it in itself because that's something even in a tougher capital markets environment that we've experienced up until a year or two ago. Um, it was something that we could finance with the combination of bank debt and our own capital, which is what we ended up doing. Uh, so that was a big plus. Um, the location is a big plus. Uh, the fact that we're about 45 minutes drive, literally from Halifax International Airport, um, means that infrastructure is, is, is very present. Um, we didn't have to run power lines very far. We didn't have to construct highways to the door. That all of those things were already present. Um, uh, our workforce is essentially on our doorstep in the areas surrounding areas of Dartmouth and, and Halifax which means we don't have a, a typical camp. We, d we don't have to construct a um, uh, uh, ice runway as we do in some parts of northern Canada for flying in and flying out of supplies and fuel and that sort of stuff. All those things add up incrementally to uh, lowering or in some cases if you, if you don't have those things present increasing incrementally those, those cash costs um, and, and capital costs for that matter. Canadian dollar, you mentioned that. that, that's an important driver. You're effectively building a project uh, with a 25% discount to the US dollar right now. Um, and that's a big plus. Uh, th those are the sorts of things that attracted us to uh, our, our project of Moose River. From a, from a geological perspective, uh, that was a big attraction to us as well. So you mentioned a lot of things there that, that majors have publicly stated they're looking for in potential acquisitions and buyout targets, the jurisdiction, the access to workforce, the, 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 the mining friendly nature of Canada and Nova Scotia. And so the project itself already checks a lot of boxes, um, but there, there's more potential there. You guys already have a 2.1 million ounce global resource and you're, you're working towards, as I understand it, uh, a, a new resource uh, estimate. And there's potential for, for, for more discoveries, I think, in the latest slide deck, if I'm not mistaken, I noticed one of the slides said you think there's potential for another uh, deposit discovery uh, at the Moose River Project. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, in addition to being headed to production in September, the upside, the exploration potential at, at Moose River? The project as we know, as we call it Moose River Consolidated, is really a consolidation of uh, four different deposits that are all within trucking distance of the central milling facility that we're presently constructing uh, at the moment at Moose River. Um, the, the approach we're taking on the exploration front is, is twofold. One, there are two deposits which we call Cochrane Hill and 15 Mile Stream, which were n not in the base case feasibility study, but they were in, in indicated and inferred resource categories, which means that what we needed to do was drill, do some more drilling to increase the density of, of that data, which will allow us to then um, categorize those resources as measured. As soon as we've done that, that then allows us to incorporate those deposits that's more, just over 1.1 million ounces actually, as an additional production source for our base case project. So that was part of it. The other part is, is what, you, what you're referencing, the, 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 the exploration, mm -hmm. pure exploration side. This is, believe it or not, this is the first time uh, there's ever been any modern exploration for the deposit model that we have and that deposit model is open pitable resource, in other words, within two or 300 meters of surface, where you've got a package of mineralized rocks, starting with the traditional quartz veins that were mined since the 1830s by the old timers, that sit in the host argillite rocks, the shales, um, that happen to also be mineralized. And those host rocks, the argillite rocks, are not mineralized at, as, as, at, at grades that are as high as the ones we see typically in the quartz veins, but they are very profitable and very economic at grades at you know, between one and a half and two grams in, in an open pit. 
And so what, what our exploration model is, is where do these, these two uh, domains of mineralization coincide? The quartz veins sitting in these argillite rocks. They weren't, the, the argillite rocks weren't ever of interest to the old timers because they were below economic sure. cutoff, they were low grade. But when you combine them and put them in an open pit, the economics of those are very strong, as you, you well know with our, our two core deposit, it's a two to one strip ratio, uh, you know, around 520 US dollar equivalent cash costs, all in, including sustaining costs. It's the combination of that grade, the, 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 the infrastructure in the area, the Canadian dollar, uh, and the, 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 the low strip that drive those costs. And we're convinced that there are other deposits like uh, these uh, yet to be discovered. So uh, just to put an umbrella on it, you have the Moose River Consolidated Project, there's the Tokoy deposit, there's the 15 mile stream deposit, uh, there's this Cochran Hill. Um, and I think a good analogy is a, a string of pearls. Now you were also involved in the McRae's um, project of Oceana Gold in New Zealand, and, and that's, that's similar to, to, to what we have here. If, if we take each of your deposits as a pearl, can you talk about the, the string of pearls analogy and how it, it relates to your, to your experience with the McRae's deposit? Yeah, in, in fact, that, now that's a great question because that was what got us most excited about what we saw at Moose River. Um, you, you, you're quite right, I was involved in the very early days doing construction and financing, um, and, and involved later when we created Oceana Gold uh, as a spin-out of a, of a predecessor company uh, in, uh, in the early 2000s. And the McRae's deposit in New Zealand is set, like our deposits, uh, in sedimentary rocks, um, uh, structurally controlled, and when the McRae's project kicked off um, in the mid to late 80s, um, they had around 600,000 ounces of resources, I think four or 500,000 ounces in reserves in a single pit. Mm -hmm. um, 31 years later, that project is still operating. Uh, I think it's produced almost uh, in the order of four million ounces and still a number of ounces to go at low costs um, from 10 separate deposits, or, and, and which are now 10 um, open pits. I see the same potential here at, at Moose River um, for, the, for the reasons I just explained. Similar, similar rocks, similar structural controls, um, uh, and, and a structure that goes 80, 90 kilometers or more uh, hosting these, these deposits. And uh, uh, with due diligent exploration that we're conducting right now, I see us potentially adding, uh, like McRae's did, several other deposits in, exist in, in addition to the four we have at the present. Well, I think that hits at the heart of the matter and the heart of the opportunity for an investor as it relates to Atlantic Gold. You have this base case that your, all your economics are, are, are put forth on, but there's also this significant upside potential and the potential to extend the mine life beyond the, the current base case. And I think that's the, that's the reality that investors are waking up to, right? The stock has doubled so far this year in, in 2017, and it's, it's tripled in the last in two years and so I think investors are starting to wake up to this opportunity and yet at the same time there's still much ahead for Atlantic Gold. As you mentioned you have the grade control drilling ongoing, uh, you have commissioning expected in, in September. Can you talk maybe a little bit about what the next six to twelve months looks like for, for Atlantic Gold? Uh, we're, we're expecting at the end of June or the first week in July somewhere around the middle of the year to be able to um, release a new resource statement for Cochrane Hill and for 15 Mile Stream, the other two deposits that are not presently in our life of mine plan. Um, and the objective there is uh, with this 50 or 60,000 meters of drilling that we've been undertaking since October, we will upgrade the, the confidence level to measure it and that will allow us to make that, those resources a proven reserve once we've completed our engineering. But in June, uh, we will come up with uh, new resource statements w with a measured category confidence uh, in those resources 
and perhaps add some additional ounces from some step out drilling that we've done at both of those deposits. So that's the first catalyst. The next catalyst will be um, commencement of commissioning. Always an exciting time. It is. Um, uh, in July, we will be undertaking what's called dry commissioning, meaning turning motors and, and, and the plant over. Uh, in August, um, uh, wet commissioning, and then in September 1st, ore to the mill. Uh, and, and that's a critical turning point for us, and that will mark the transition from explorer slash developer to uh, uh, producer and cash flow generator. And you know, I'm sure from your experience, you would agree that that's typically a big valuation catalyst for most companies. Uh, and then also in September, uh, the same month, we expect to be able to release a new life of mine plan which will uh, reflect the additional ounces that we see potentially from Cochrane and from 15 Mile. Stephen, one thing that sticks out in my mind uh, regarding Atlantic Gold is how quickly you were able to consolidate the project, uh, bring it under sole ownership, and, and then get it under construction. Can you talk about the, the time frame that it's taken you and, and, and how that relates to others that have done it? Yeah, um, I think that's one of the things that I'm particularly proud of in terms of our management team is is that we put we consolidated the, the four deposits, which is our, our current resource base, um, under our ownership in the space of about 18, 18 months, uh, including getting in that same time frame uh, permitting uh, finished off for, for the Tukwe development. Um, uh, fixed price EPC contract for the construction negotiated and debt financing as well as some equity financing all within a, as I said about 18 months and then uh, a 15 month construction schedule um, with uh, w with Asenko which will allow, allow us to, to come in on time and on budget in September um, uh, those time frames I think are are very short in, in, in the industry. Um, time is money. Mm -hmm. um, the longer you delay putting a project into production and generating cash flow, the more you diminish your returns ultimately on the project because you're having to meet carrying costs and property holding costs and overheads and what have you. We as an industry don't always talk about those, but they do have an impact, and, and so our, our objective is to, con to compact those time frames so you can get into production cash flow as soon as, as soon as possible. Yeah, that's definitely one of the things I looked at when I was you know, deciding whether or not to, to cover the, the story and recommend it, and time is money, as you say, and you guys have done very well executing on that front, so you know, we're gonna be headed into production in just a couple of months here, and the base case says that it's gonna be 90,000 ounces a year of production from the deposits you currently have, but you know, with, uh, with the drilling you've done and, and with uh, the new resource you're gonna come out with, we're looking to potentially double or triple that. Can you talk about uh, the, the life of mine and the, the annual ounces produced and how that's gonna grow and extend? Sure, well, I, I, I don't know what we're gonna be able to achieve yet. That's gonna be dependent upon you know, where the resource estimates come out in the next month or two and, and uh, where our engineering comes out. But our objective, our target, is to uh, put in place a life of mine plan where we're producing of the order of 150 to 250,000 ounces a year for an eight to 10 year mine life as, 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 a, as a target. Um, and if we're successful with that, then that, the, the project and our business will be uh, worth substantially more than it is today. Well, and I think that's probably one of the things institutions looked at when they were uh, deciding whether to invest and take a stake in Atlantic Gold, as Sprott and Rick Wool have done. I believe they own 10% of the company. Can you talk about your relationship with Rick and why they decided to invest in Atlantic Gold? Rick's involvement actually uh, goes back to the, to, to the very genesis of what is Atlantic Gold, in that he and I sat down and said, with the $30 million of cash that we managed to put together in the company, let's go back into the sector and when, when the sector was down and out and, and, and we're at the bottom of the cycle, um, we were looking for opportunities like this to, 
to uh, pursue and apply our skills to develop and, and, and take these projects through to development. Um, and, and so Rick's been involved since the, the very beginning and he's been a great supporter uh, to us over the years in getting to where we are today. And as you say, he's still a, a substantial holder of around 10%. Well, I have to imagine he looks for undervalued companies if the, the, the point of resource investing and in all investing in fact is to buy low and sell high. And on one important metric that we look at in the resource space is you know, multiples of cash flow once the mine comes into production. And by that metric, you're currently being valued at the low end of the spectrum. And so you know, as an analyst, as an investor myself, when I see a company that has you know, assets like yours, production profile like yours, and is being, and is being only valued at, a, at the low end of the spectrum relative to its peers, to me that, that screams undervalued. Can you explain uh, how those, those multiple valuations work and where you stand in, in relation to your peers currently? Sure. Um, th those multiples are um, a function of the, what, what uh, the industry calls consensus estimates of, uh, by, by brokers and research analysts that c cover the company. And, and uh, I think right now that's, that has us at around 3 or 3.2 or thereabouts with a peer group average of producer peers, uh, we're not producing yet, but we're pretty close, mm -hmm. uh, at, a, a more, uh, at a number closer to six. So that would suggest that there is room for re-rating um, of the valuation of our business and our share price. On top of that, as we've touched on, we also have this expansion scenario, which could even reduce that current valuation even lower, which means that we've got an even bigger potential valuation catch up uh, in, in the near future, particularly after we uh, announce our revised life and mine plan incorporating Cochrane and 15 Mile into our, into our uh, production profile. So those two things are definitely drivers. Um, I, I tend to approach it a little more simply in that um, it doesn't matter whether you're in the gold business or you know, the table manufacturing business. Uh, businesses buy and sell uh, on multiples of those cash flows. Mm -hmm. We're currently valued around $250, $260 million uh, Canadian in, in the market and we're destined to uh, generate an operating cash flow based on our production profile of around 90,000 ounces uh, with a cash cost in Canadian dollars of just under $700 and a Canadian dollar gold price of about $1,700 means we've got a operating cash flow including sustaining capex per ounce of about $1,000 per ounce. So quick math is 90,000 ounces at $1,000 an ounce is at around $90 million in cash flow. So go back to that market cap value today of around 250, 260. That means that we're trading at less than three times our operating cash flow. And that's easy math for any investor to, 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 to do. Um, as I said, it doesn't matter whether you're in the gold business or any other business. That's good value in my opinion. Well, Stephen, it's a fantastic project. It's a fantastic management team. There's some really strong economics, as we've discussed. There's the potential for a, a stock re-rating as you head into production. We didn't even talk about what happens if the price of gold goes to $1,350 or $1,500 gold because we don't need to. The project is, is so economic and robust at today's prices. And I think that's why investors are getting excited about it. I'm proud to cover the story as the editor of Wall Street's Underground Profits, and I look forward to seeing the, the, the project head into commissioning and production. And, and I encourage investors to check out the story, and, and especially before the, the first gold starts being poured in, in Nova Scotia. So, Stephen, thanks a lot for taking a few minutes to chat with me about the project today. Thanks, Dick. Appreciate it. Thanks for watching my interview with Stephen Dean, Chairman, CEO, and Director of Atlantic Gold. I just wanted to mention quickly that in addition to everything we talked about with Atlantic Gold, we didn't even have to mention the gold price because Atlantic has such robust ec robust economics at today's current gold price of you know 1260 US, around 1700 dollars Canadian. Um, and if we talk about you know catalyst for a potential rising gold price, you have you know record high debt levels around the world. You have you know global stock market indices at, at record high you have negative real interest rates, you have mounting geopolitical tensions, you have an unprecedented 
presidential situation in the U.S. And all of these underlying factors are things that can potentially drive up the gold price over the medium to long term. And I think that Atlantic's current economic situation lends itself highly to being leveraged to the price of gold. You know, if it's economic uh, at today's gold price, it's going to be driven up many multiples higher than its current uh, you know, market cap valuation as gold potentially rises to $1,300, $1,400 or $1,500 gold, as many analysts are calling for. So I would encourage you to check out the project. You can learn more about it by going to www.atlanticgoldcorp.com. And you can always learn more about my publications at www.outsiderclub.com.